Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me this evening on uh, this webinar for street and portrait photography. Uh, nice day outside across the country, which is a bit cruel in the situation we are, but hopefully for the next hour, you'll um, pick up a few tips on how I shoot my street and also my portrait photography and how I manage my color as well. Um, so we're sort of just gonna dive straight into it. If you've got questions, there's a question panel on the side. If you want to pop your questions in there, Alexandra will be looking at those and we'll try and answer those as we go along. Um, if not, we'll try and answer some at the end. There'll be a Q&A session at the end as well. But, you know, just pop your questions in there and we'll do the best we can to answer what we can as we go along. And remember, this is the way I sort of work. So um, there's a million ways how people shoot. So this is just the way I sort of work. So if you pick up anything, that'd be amazing. And I also wanted to point out the image on the banner that has been out there. It is completely unretouched. The only thing that I've done with it uh, is use the color checker to white balance. And I just wanted to put an image out there like that because um, so many images are so retouched uh, so much. You don't necessarily have to do a lot. You know, I could just remove the hair from the eye and, thing, and things like that. So if you can get it right, you're laughing. So let's crack on. So um, my passion is street photography and my business is portrait and commercial photography. And that's sort of obviously dried up at the moment. But I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, who is Ross Grieve? I am a portrait and commercial photographer. I am from New Zealand and I live in Wales and Pembrokeshire, in fact. I've been a professional photographer for over 24, 25 years. And I love my street photography where that sort of is my therapy for my photography. I get out there and I can sort of express and just lose myself and just go around and create images uh, and not so much of a controlled environment. And I'm also a real color geek. Um, from Simon, uh, West, what's my favorite lens to use for street photography? I shoot my street photography on a Lumix GX9 and the lens on that is a 15 mil. So because it's a micro four thirds camera, that's equivalent to a 30 mil in full frame terms. Um, it's a prime lens and I tend to use uh, that because it's uh, very unintrusive. You, I don't want to be going out and shooting a big like zoom lens, but I'll come on to that a lot later about sort of the kit I use on my street photography. So giving you a little look on my setup uh, in my office. So on the right, we've got um, a 27 inch iMac. On the left is the BenQ 321C, the SW321C. That is a 32 inch monitor, which doesn't look that big compared to the um, 27 inch iMac. Now you also notice the reflection coming off the iMac screen is very apparent. The reflection on the BenQ screen, there is none. And also the flicker is due to the camera, that's not to, due to the screen. Um, I was actually saying to a mate yesterday, or in fact today, using this new uh, BenQ monitor has actually enhanced my retouching because there's no reflection. It's actually editing on photographic paper um, it's such a joy and the detail in it is absolutely insane. Um, I've only had this on a loan for about a month. In fact, it's leaving me tomorrow and talk about dangling a carrot because I know I will wanting to be in, investing in one as well because they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, so yeah, so on the left is all my editing I will do on the BenQ monitor. The one on the right I'll use for like previews, but I will uh, split screen and, and and do my emails on my, um, on my iMac. And I also, if I'm gonna use Photoshop, I'll drag that across and I'll do that on, on um, the BenQ monitor as well. Uh, an important thing which I did this morning on any monitor is to calibrate it. Uh, now I use an i1 Studio to calibrate my screens and that can um, calibrate uh, my mobile phone devices my projectors, uh, my printers as well. So that's why I tend to use that because I do in-house printing. If you're not using in-house printing, there are other options as well. And what will happen, it'll go through um, different color sort of uh, spaces and it'll run through 118 color spaces 
and calibrate those to your screen. I do that about once a week. And it's a really good habit to get into as well. You'll notice on the desk, uh, just below the BenQ monitor, there's like a little um, hockey puck. And on that, I can change between Adobe RGB, uh, sRGB, and black and white. So three different color spaces I can jump between just to look at uh, at the touch of a button. And you may be thinking, well, what does it matter? Um, if I'm going to be printing, I want to use Adobe um, Adobe RGB because it's a bigger color space, which means I've got more colors more um, and more true colors than that. Unfortunately, if you're going to go online, which we're so used to seeing everything online, most browsers only like um, sRGB. So you can shoot in Adobe RGB, convert it, convert it to the other color space for online if you choose to. Um, when I travel as well, um, I do pack um, my i1 studio to come with me. It's a rare sight uh, at an airport at the moment, sort of people in it, but I, I will take that with me because when I take my um, laptop with me, wherever you go with a laptop, the lighting conditions change. So if you're using a desktop monitor, obviously that's fixed. Um, a mobile uh, laptop, obviously uh, the lighting conditions change. So hence I will take i1 studio with me and I will calibrate when I get to my hotel room because that light is going to be different to where I've been previously. So it sort of makes sense. So let's sort of dive into a little bit and sort of start talking about some imagery as well. So this is, uh, this is Esther. Uh, she's a good friend of mine. And this is sort of how she was sort of shot on the left. Um, just one light set up, bouncing off a reflector, and with a Manfrotto background behind as well. So really, really simple setup. So um, what we want to do, if we just jump in to good old uh, Lightroom, you'll see me standing there with a color checker card. Now I'm using the gray card on that and you're thinking, what does that do? And this is what I do every time. So you've just seen that image of Esther. And this is the reference card I took of Esther just before um, we did the shoot. Now, if you want to know some shortcuts on Lightroom, if you hit D, it'll jump straight into develop. And then I'm just going to jump up here. I'm going to pick up my droplet tool. I'm going to go and hover over the gray card, which 18% gray. And you should have seen the color change there straight away. And I'll just show you the before and after. So before on the left, it's very, very warm. And you can an easy way to sort of look at it is look at the whites. And if you look at Esther's jumper on the on the right hand side, the whites are now nice and nice and very, very true. Now, if I've got a whole lot of images from Esther and I want and I've shot them in the same lighting situation and I want to apply that, I can just go and hit I can highlight it down the bottom just by clicking it or and clicking all of them. So if I wanted to click all of these, just assume they have the same image. I would hit shift. And that would select all of them. But because these two are from the same lighting situation, I'm just going to click those two. And I'm going to hit sync. Now, what's happened is all the settings from here and the white balance settings from the original one have been transferred to this one of Esther. Now, if we look at the before and after now, oops, wrong that one. So if you look at the before and before, it's very, very warm. And then if you look at the right one, it's a correct color. They've got a true sort of skin tones going on there as well. And a true, I know what the colors are in the background and that's come through more. So just by doing that, it makes a huge difference. Now, if you are uh, keen eyed, you'll notice up the top, my profile is actually selected for my camera as well. So I've already profiled my camera and that was done using the color checker as well. And it's using this card so that I can create a profile. I can save a DNG from this, export that, bring it in um, to the color checker software. It'll look at that. It'll recognize all the um, squares and matrix, make a calculation. And then it'll it'll place that into Lightroom for you, and then you just restart Lightroom. Now this is for every color situation as well. So you've got your camera calibrated, 
and you've also done your white balance so you get really really true colors and once you've got that base level that's when you can move on and start sort of having a play and um, doing other things that you want to sort of muck around with so there we are the two reference ones and you don't have to zoom in it does help a little bit if you zoom in on the one on the left with all the matrix colors that will help you a little bit um, and the one I use most of the time is just to do my white balance so normally this is my setup in my studio um, the studio is now set up for more video than anything at the moment but this is sort of a day-to-day -day setup where people will come in um, I've got overhead lights I've got a nice big octave there as well um, and then I've got a strip light on the side um, and that's sort of what I tend to use the most but also you're sort of thinking well I haven't got a studio what am I going to do we well, can really use that big thing in the sky called the sun and I'm going to sort of give you some tips on that as well but you can also overpower the sun as well and get some amazing results so this is taken up in Norfolk this is Esther again um, always been the model for us which is great so this is just one light off to the side you can see actually see the shape of the softbox and Esther's uh, glasses now what's happened here this is a high-speed sync shot the sun is dropping very very quickly so I, I'm literally adjusting everything manually as, as it drops down this is pretty much out of camera as well um, and because um, everything's changed so quickly I'm not worried about the background color so we sort of calibrated on her um, white top it's the whites that are important to me there so everything's dropping down very very quickly um, and just chucking that light in to illuminate Esther and then get the the sunset going down in the background also when you're shooting at home window light is one of the most beautiful lights you can have however this is actually using a strip light if you've got a strip light at home which is a, a tall narrow light you could use that one way to create a strip light at home is just draw the curtains so there's a little gap of light coming in and then you can sort of create your own strip light obviously if you open those curtains a little bit more then you've got more of a soft box sort of look to it as well so that sort of gives you a different look so just by opening and closing your curtains you can create different light shape which in the eyes looks completely different so this was shot recently as well this was a one light setup um, and it was up in a group uh, yesterday and people were trying to guess how it was shot um, so it's different you don't always have to sort of uh, have people's eyes looking straight at you it does have that engaging sort of look but it's nice to sort of create something different so this setup was just a light off camera very very close and this is uh, the pair on this light is a one two five it's an Allen chrome um, EL, ELC one two five nice soft box 70 mil a 70 center deep soft box I've just got Grace just sort of looking into the light there as well and you create this beautiful softness across behind her is a reflector just bouncing a little bit of light back in which helps you can create you can create your own reflectors at home you can use um, old newspaper or just stick a load of um, A4 paper together um, you can use tin foil on a piece of card or white card if you've got some white card you can be really creative on what you can actually use so this is the result and lighting result of Grace uh, in the next shot. On the left, you can see uh, the result just with the light bouncing off and a little bit of light coming in from the left-hand side, just lighting her hair and enough in the hands. I wasn't too worried about separation because I just wanted everything uh, to be on her and just her hair and everything like that. The one on the right, um, this is a completely different setup again, and then I would have put in the color checker once again to get the look uh, that I wanted um, you also notice the placement of the lights in the eyes if you're trying to break down on someone's photo how they've shot it have a look in the eyes and how that is that can be a, a giveaway I tend if I've got two catch lights in the eyes I will try and remove one so there's one left um, but sort of have a look and, and see how that is done that sort of gives you an understanding so the next photo gives you an idea on how Grace's images 
were set up and how they were taken. So you can see the reflector on the left. Um, the light above was brought down and faced uh, directly towards her. I've got a mirror just in front of the tripod so she can see how she, she is posing as well. And that was not because there was not any light bouncing back into her or not enough light, so it didn't really affect the shot. You also notice I am tethered and I've got the screen pointing back towards Grace so she can see the shot that's been taken. So it gives her an idea on what is going on. And it just sort of helps people with posing and things like that as well. So this was Emily. Uh, Emily came to the studio with her big sister and her mum and dad for some photos. And this was done about a year, year or so ago now, but I love this photo so much because being the youngest, you can be a little bit nervous and you sort of think, you know, you've got a big sister to live up beside you, big sister's all confident and everything. And it can be really, really tricky. And you want to make someone feel really comfortable in your studio. So when I have kids in the studio, um, I try and create a little bit of madness because every kid loves a bit of madness and well, most the adults do as well. So all I did, I gave her a pair of sunglasses and a hat. And I just asked her to do exactly the same pose that she has in this, which was just folding her arms. And this is the result. Very, very simple. She's rocked it. I've changed the lighting so it's more dramatic. You'll notice the light has now moved from her eyes, which is more to the side, and it's become above her, and it's a beauty dish above her as well. The trick to this photo is just getting the, the about a third of the light in the, in the glasses, and that gives that effect, and then everything else is just falling off behind her. You can add a light behind. If you want to add a light on the background, that's fine as well, but sometimes you'll get enough fall off from the light. The light will hit the background as well. Even with boys, it works well as well. We have Owen, my son here, rocking the sunglasses and the, light, the beauty dish just hitting the top of the light as well. So, and the trick here is to the placement of the cap because the brim of a cap is quite uh, wide. But if you sort of give it that sort of funky sort of look, tilt it to the side a bit, and then the light will, will hit the face and it'll look really, really cool. And kids love this sort of thing. It's simple, it's fun, and people enjoy it. Now, Tim, uh, this was actually shot at a convention as well. And the way this is lit is two lights. So if you look in his eyes, the main key light is coming from the left um, up high and it's just hitting his shoulder. But there is a light behind him, which is giving a nice little room light and a light on the side of his face or looking at the image on the right hand side of the face. But it's not as bright as the one on the left. In fact, it's probably actually better exposed, if I'm honest. And it's just hitting that, and that's a little kicker. So that's about 45 degrees behind him. And that give, makes his beard sort of um, accentuated more. And it's, he's just got a really, really interesting face with the, with the cap and everything, and it works really, really well. But you can sort of try these things indoors, outside as well. And when you've got the kids at home now as well, get them involved and get them taking photos of you, whether it's on a phone or anything like that. Um, and they'll absolutely love it. And it's about having fun. That's the main thing. And when you're going to have fun, you've got to involve the family pet as well. So this is Ebony. She's running flat out towards me. And this was shot using um, a technique called 4K photography and just converted to black and white in Lightroom. And then she's running towards me. And I just pulled a frame in 4K because I can shoot uh, at a higher frame rate. But that's a whole other webinar altogether. But shoot your, photograph your pets as well, your kids with your pets, your family with your pets. Get Photograph people in that home environment because each room has different lighting as well and you'll get used to that. Each room will have different lighting and colour at different parts of the day because remember you'll have golden hour, blue hour as well, um, and midday sun. That will change as well. So start getting used to that colour because in the evenings you get beautiful colour like this and it just becomes golden. Now, as you may have noticed in some of my, my pictures, um, I tend to have my own sort of presets and a lot of my stuff is uh, desaturated, if you like. Um, so if I hit E, I'll go back to library and I'm just gonna scroll down uh, to the bottom here of five. I tend to have one catalog as well, unless I'm doing a job overseas or something like that, and I'll make a catalog um, sort of live for that. Um, so this is uh, sort of, uh, UK shooters, 
which we sort of I did a workshop with them. And I created a lot of images from this. Now if I just scroll right through to the end, and also part of my selection process, you'll see I've got a white flag, a flag that is black, and this is, I will select the unflagged ones here, and I'll hit P for a pick, which is the white flag, and X for um, reject, which will go black flag, but it doesn't delete it, that's the beauty of it. So if I just hit the white flag, and I'll turn the green one off, that's why not everything else is coming up, that's the ones I've picked all the way through. And then I'll refine that even more, and it'll, you'll see all the ones that I liked come up. Um, so this is the uh, one I, if you want to have a look at my setting, that's no problem at all as well. I'll just bring that down to, you'll see my settings on the right. So I've boosted the clarity quite high, and I haven't touched the uh, saturation much at all, but I've just played around with the exposure, brought that down, and that's all that's happened there. There's nothing really sort of um, majorly uh, messing around with that. It's just the light coming through, which is so beautifully warm that makes that image. And then the next shot was this, and then my battery was done for the day. I only had the one battery in my pocket, so that was that was sort of done. But there's little easy sort of uh, techniques that you can use if you sort of shoot into the sun. That that sunburst was genuinely there. Um, and then if I just click on this for you and develop, there's actually a, um, a grad or uh, coming down here, which is one of these, which is neutral density grad, which makes it a bit lighter because this was blown out. So that's how I've sort of coped with that. Even when you're inside as well, and this this sort of photo breaks the rules as they say. It's the classic, the nose is breaking the cheek line, but that doesn't bother me so much. I've got this beautiful triangle of light on his eye closest to camera. Um, yes, if he was slightly facing me more, it would maybe would have looked good, but I like the innocence of the shot. And all I've told him, just sort of look up in that corner for me. And he's just turned his turned his face and looked that way. And it looks really, really nice. I like the fact he's got the jacket thrown on, on the sofa. That works in with it as well. If the jacket wasn't there, that would look really, really empty. So think about these little things that you're adding to it as well. This, I wanted to create a New York scene within London. So I think I've almost got there, and the bit that sort of ruins it for me is the Range Rover downstairs with the yellow number plate on the back. But yes, I could edit that out of there. I don't like spending a lot of time in Photoshop, if I'm honest, because I like actually taking photos. And I think that's a really key thing, especially when we've got this time with us now and the weather we've got. Um, and I'm just looking outside now, and there's that beautiful golden light just starting to appear. We can get outside early in the morning, or we can sort of go out now or after this webinar finishes and take some images and sort of understand how the light works and get the kids to enjoy those sunsets, get them outside while this weather is amazing. And the results are just beautiful. You can warm up your images in Lightroom if you, if you want to as well by just adjusting the color temperature bar. So we have um, an image here and I'll, I'm just going to dial it back a little bit so we can grab, say, a warm image here. And if I go up to the color temperature up the top, I could just either cool it down or so it depends what you want to do. It depends what sort of look you want. And that's entirely personal choice. Well, you see the two images on the left here. We've got the nice warm light, and that's complemented by the cover on the back, which is actually on the same color palette. And when people talk about color palettes, they mean within a picture, there is a selection of colors that complement each other. Um, so we've got the nice uh, hair, which is sort of a, a nice golden color. The skin's a nice golden color. The sofa's that uh, yellowy sort of uh, color. The drapes and the mirror, where the mirror gives depth to the photo as well. So have a look at something like that. And then the cover on the back of the magazine complements everything as well. So it all ties in together nice, nice, nicely. And then you look at the image on the right, exactly the same window, believe it or not. Um, just pop that down. And it's just, let's crunch that hat down. I, I'm not worried about seeing the eyes. It just makes the image look much more interesting. 
but then you can't turn. There's obviously what the light source is there. That's a window light source. So then we've, we're using the same model in two different situations. So we've got this classic studio shot. And yes, I have retouched one of the highlights out. There is actually below her, there is a reflector popping some light um, up into Helen's uh, face there. So that's been retouched out. And then the one on the right is just pure daylight and it's just a black and white conversion. That's all that's done. So coming in from the right, so just lighten her there. There's no other lights um, put in there. And I like this, I shot this at quite a high ISO, the black and white one, and I like grain. I liked grain and black and white photos when I shot film. I thought it was absolutely beautiful. And I think uh, if that's brought back in, I think that that's really, really essential. And it sort of gives a bit of life to your image as well. Doesn't mean you have to use grain in every image you use. It works better in black and white, but it's just another thing that you can experiment with when you're photographing with the kids. What looks good grainy, what doesn't. So there's lots of good things that you can try out. Again, in the studio, black and white, but no grain this time, but very a lot of detail in that image. And when when you're shooting kids, get them to sit down on a sofa or a chair or a cushion or a beanbag. They'll love being uh, sitting around. They'll love having their photo taken and get down to their level. This is the big thing. A lot of people will stand up and take their photos standing up rather than getting down to a kid's level. And you get down to a kid's level, they'll giggle, they'll laugh at you, and you'll get an image from their perspective as well. And you'll notice these two images were almost shot on the floor. So you get that lovely sort of leading lines running down and looking at where the kids are, and they're just having a, a good time. She was happy on the left, trust me. And then sometimes you can just go crazy with lots and lots of fabric. So this was shot on the Color Confidence, an x uh day at Rest Park. And I attached 15 meters of fabric to the back of Alice. And we basically went from there and had two people sort of just lifting the fabrics to get some air underneath it either side. And this is the end result. So you can have a lot of fun, um, use sheets around the home or stuff like that and see what sort of results you get. Just use some clothes pegs, make a cape or something like that. And you can have so much fun um, with the kids and the family, just having a laugh, making them into superheroes, um, having a cape each side and then dropping it and make sure that you're out of picture. It looks really, really nice. I thought I'd quickly touch on commercial stuff because there is an overlap for me with portraiture. So this, these were taken both with available light, so just daylight, but the blinds, um, there was quite harsh sunlight coming in because this is actually just north of Dubai. Um, but they had this nice netting. So I just drew that netting across the window and that diffused or softened the light. So you've got this beautiful light hitting Chef Yuki here. Um, and he is very, very pleased with his uh, images, which is always nice to hear. Then we got the whole team. They were happy again as well, but we're getting the ambient light uh, coming in. And you'll notice there's two colors in the light. Daylight is very blue and um, tungsten lights or inside lights are very warm or very yellow. So you can sort of see that balance there, and that's quite interesting, I think, to how you treat your images um, and look at them as well. Again, these were all shot using available light and daylight in the restaurant because it reflects what the customer is going to see. Likewise, with the image here, this was shot in available light. In fact, this was shot for a different um, hotel chain in Thailand. They, they had set out a beautiful white table, brought everything out placed the white plate on the white table, and I sort of looked at that, then looked at the decking I'm standing on, picked the plate up, put it on the decking, and we did the whole shoot just on the decking, which um, proved very popular with them, but then sometimes you just see things that will work. This uh, was shot uh, last year for, um, for Panasonic, actually. It was over in Japan, and this is shot inside. It's not using daylight, it's used control lights. Now, if you want to use lights inside, Everyone's got torches on their phone, or most houses have got um, a torch in that. And you can try using that as your point of light. Rather than having a flash, you can actually just use a torch. So you've got this continuous light, so you sort of understand where it's coming from. So the light is behind, and the light is uh, behind, sorry. I'm just going back. The light is, that's the one I'm looking for. The light is behind, and then I've got a reflector in front. 
and that bounces a bit of light back. The reason the light is behind, because it creates a nice shadow in front. You can see in the ice cream there, we've got this nice shadow in the front here. If the light was in, in, at the front, we would have uh, a completely flat image. There'd be no shadows at the front, there'd be no definition. Hence, the light is at the front. And then we have Chef uh, checking over the images with me, creative di director there as well, and everything was happy and we all, all went home after two days full on shooting. Uh, this is how I get kids involved when they come into the studio. Get them to hold a color checker and hold the color checker correctly. Um, you don't want fingers around the top, but if you give a kid something to be involved with and they'll hold it, they think they're the bee's knees straight away. If, you, if I gave that to mum and dad or something like that, they wouldn't feel so involved. And mum and dad want to see their kids involved and to sort of break, it's a good um, icebreaker for kids who come in the studio or if you want to shoot them outside as well, that's also uh, very, very useful. So then I'll get my base color and then this is a nice uh, color balance shot, but then I'm, I've gone sort of a bit stream for you here. I could really cool the image down if I wanted to, and that would give that completely sort of desaturated sort of cold look if you like um, and somber looking like um, to a child if you've got any image any questions on uh, the portraiture please just pop them in the questions and i'll come to those uh, at the end or as we go along so street photography street photography is something that i am extremely passionate about i love it um, i shoot it as much as i can because i live in pembrokeshire so when i go up to the cities i get quite excited um, which sort of leads me to, there is a couple of types of photographers, uh, street photographers. There's the patient one who will stand there and wait and wait and wait for the subject to walk in. And that will sort of be uh, the type of person um, like uh, Damien DeMolda, Chris Riley. Um, they will wait for people to walk into their shot and get these beautiful high, con high contrast silhouettes. And they are stunning. Um, Alan Scheller, him sort of, his imagery as well. But I am the click and move on. So I will see an image, I will take it, and I'll move on. Maybe that's because I used to shoot on film and I didn't want to take a thousand photos of the same thing. Um, but I'll move on. And I'll also talk to people as well because people like being spoken to if you're polite to them. So I will say hello to someone. And generally the reply is hello back. Um, and it's a problem with societies now. We've got so entrenched in a mobile phone devices, we don't talk to people enough. So when I am out, I'm very polite and very respectful, um, but I, and I will interact people uh, to get some images. But the beauty about street photography, again, it gets you to understand light and it's really perfect for imp improving your skills. In the questions or the answers, pop in the box to see if you know what this plant is. I'll tell you at the end, if someone guesses it, I'll see who's right. Um, but it's, it's quite interesting and no one has got it yet. I've showed this image on a few talks and no one has got this right. But your understanding of light will improve. The best thing about street photography as well, it's free. You can go out there and just shoot to your heart's content in your own time. You're not rushed or anything like that and you can have a great time. Um, I thought I'd also touch on shutters as well, which is quite important when you're out there shooting street. Um, there's two types of shutters. There's a rolling shutter or an electronic shutter. So the rolling shutter, the pixels will sort of turn off and on and they'll just roll down. So when some people go out and they get banding across, that's because of the rolling shutter and it's not at the same frequency as the lights are. So you can see the photo of the shard on the right that was taken using a mechanical shutter or total shutter. So I haven't got that uh, rolling shutter effect. And that's quite, because um, when I first came across that, about five years ago when I was new to uh, Micro Four Thirds cameras, um, I asked a question and that was explained and then I completely understood it. And, and from then on, I didn't have that problem. This image has popped up today. You may have seen it sort of uh, advertising uh, the webinar, but it was actually one of my very, very first um, street photography photos. It was taken in London, it was taken uh, in Dublin, I beg your pardon, and I was taken in Temple Bar and I was taken through a pub window. And it's very, very poignant with what's going on at the moment. There's a gentleman beside a, um, a chemist sign and we've got the camera looking straight back onto me and he is in his home 
but just outside it. So it's very, I never thought an image from five years ago would be quite poignant on, on what's happening in the world today, but that's just the way it is. And it's really interesting how images can be interpreted as well, um, how they can sort of interpret a photo um, for something in the past and make it relevant to something today. But these are the sort of scenes we don't really see at the moment. This was taken in Osaka. It's a homeless man and there's people just rushing by him. This is handheld as well. It shot at about one fifth of a second and using a 15 mil uh, Leica lens um, on a GX8 it was at the time. Now 15 mil on micro four thirds is equivalent to 30 mil on full frame. Um, and he is just there hoping to get some money off people. It's just rained, so everyone's running about. They've got their brollies up. Um, and by dragging the shutter or having a slow shutter speed, it just isolates him and it focuses on him when there's just a slight gap in between people. It took I think it took me about sort of 10 sort of shots to get this right. But once you get used to that sort of speed, you can be quite dramatic in how you shoot your images as well. One thing I get asked about when I'm out and about, what do you use to edit your um, information on the fly? And I use my iPhone and I use Lightroom mobile and I use Photoshop mobile on my phone. And you'll see on the picture there, I'm editing an image. I usually go out and I will drop into cafes and I'll have a coffee and cake. I'll have lunch on the run. And people laugh when I mention coffee and cake a lot because I do have a lot of coffee and cake when I'm out shooting for a full day because you cover a lot of a lot of mileage and you want to keep your nutrition levels up. So you want to be malnourished. You don't want to sort of run yourself into the ground because you're walking around so much. Um, and then the other app you'll see there is Color True. And what Color True is, is an app that will calibrate your mobile device um, using um, devices that you, calibration devices say, um, like an i1 studio or an i1 display and that will link into that pop it onto your um, monitor onto your device or your ipad or your phone or anything like that and that'll calibrate that screen for you so that's very, very useful so then i know i've got color accuracy when i'm mobile as well and that's something really useful to know so this was this was the actual end image um so i've just basically spoken to the guard and i've asked uh, the uh, Dorman and asked if he would just stand there. One thing I could have sort of tweaked afterwards is it just got him to straighten his coat because it sort of annoys me a little bit. But it also makes it more real as well. It's that's the imperfection that sometimes can make street photography. And then I've just dragged the shutter again. So I've got the anonymity of people walking past. And this was part of a campaign that I shot called um, the Contrasts of Christmas. But I'll just jump in and I'll show you in Photoshop and Lightroom. What the actual image is like. So I'm just going to hit um, E. I'm going to go back to my um, to street photography. So now we'll bring up street photography and see. Oops. So now you can see the image here. I've made a black and white conversion of it as well. Um, and what it actually looked like. I'm just going to click this off because then I'll be on the right one. So if you can see here, this is the original, nothing much going on there. But if I bring it back to what it really looked like, which I think is quite interesting, it sort of looks a little bit flat, but I know the exposures are right and everything. So all I've gone, I've got the verticals right by the um, Harrods. And then if I go into my presets, which are on the left here, and I make my own presets as well. So this is a DSAT. Um, or desaturation. So I've got 70% deset and then I've got a deset there. So if I click on that and I want, I know I want to boost, boost the clarity a little bit more. I don't want it quite that desaturated. Um, then I'm just going to straighten it a little bit. So the Harrods is looking good. So I'm happy with that. I'm just going to boost the exposure a little bit and that's all I'll do. Job done. That's the amount of time that I will spend on my images. I don't want to spend time and time again on my images. I want to spend as little time as possible because I like getting out there and taking photos. So I mean, there's a lot of presets you can buy out there on the market, but it's good practice to actually do your own as well. Um, 
I've got no problem um, sharing my presets or anything like that. I've used three main ones. Um, that's something we'll, which we'll be, I'll be putting a package out there uh, since I've got a bit of time on my hands at the moment. That's certainly something I'll be doing. But this was, like I said, this was part of the campaign for um, the contrast of Christmas. And the other image was, if we've got the whole chocolate box looking, Harrods, people shopping, what's the other side of the contrast of Christmas looking like? And this is what it is. This is Mark. Um, I met him just outside Leicester Square Station and I went up to him and whenever I photograph people uh, who are homeless, I will go and interact with them, ask if I can photograph them because it's only fair. You don't know their situation. So I went and spoke to him and yes, he said he, he wouldn't mind being photographed. And one thing I tend to use with people is a little tester. If I'm photographing homeless people, I'll ask, do they want me to email it to them? And if they say yes and they whip out an iPhone, then I won't, I'll, I'll walk away. But Mark just said, look, if you could send it to um, the shelter, that would there be amazing. And he sort of gave me the details of the shelter that he was with. So he was legit and I hope he's in a better place now. But a really, really nice guy who's just uh, fallen out of luck, which is really unfortunate. Sometimes you'll get an image also that just pops up in front of you. So this was down uh, near Shoreditch, a gentleman on a lunch break, and he just happens to walk past this wall. And it's a very, very strong image, um, but he's just going about his day-to-day -day stuff. And it's amazing how what environment you're in can put you in different sort of context. So um, sort of think about that and how you're composing people. But also when I photograph people who are walking, I always want people to have that nice big stride on as well. If his legs were together, the image would look very undynamic because he's got a nice big walk on. It looks great. Now we've seen in the news lately, a lot of people being on the tube and things like that. This was actually staged. So this was shot about two years ago. The little girl on the right is my daughter. The children behind her, I spoke to their parents before uh, it could be photographed. And um, so everyone's legit. The guy in the middle is a good friend of mine. He's moved back to New Zealand now. So it just sort of goes to show, again, how imagery can be used out of context. Because that could be used now and people would believe it. But um, it's taken two years ago and people can generate stuff. Again, likewise, you know, I wait for ages so I could actually get this photo. I waited for the train to go and that's when I took it. And now that would probably be no problem getting that, a photo like that in London now. Not that I'd be going out to try it. Something else that really, really intrigues me as well is uh, this is normal. This is in Japan, and this is normal in Japanese culture. If someone's got a cough or something like that, they will wear a mask, just as polite not to give you uh, a cold or anything like that that they've got. So seeing masks after experiencing Japanese culture, uh, to me, felt something quite normal. But... Um, there's certainly no reason why people were going out and panic buying, but you can be quite subtle and photographing in those environments as well. They used to being photographed and didn't have an issue with being photographed as well. Same situation, lady just on a mobile phone device again. But some people feel really, really uncomfortable photographing people's faces, and you can still get some cool images by not even photographing people's faces. You can just be a bit creative, and even just photographing people's shoes, you can get a good. Um, look to it. Again, some of my images involve uh, drag shutter again. This is my image. I might rename it and call it social distancing. Again, it was taken about a year or so ago, and it's very, very poignant now. But one point, important point in this image is the guy walking by the painting. He gives scale to the image, whereas uh, if, the, if he wasn't in the image, it was just the people walking across in the front, you wouldn't have that scale to look at. Um, and the fact that he's in it, he sort of makes the image without you even knowing about it. We've got the leading lines from the footpath as well, which should lead up to everything. And it sort of brings everything together. Now, this was taken in, I think it was November last year. Uh, and I just got off the train. Uh, a guy called Matt Jacobs and I were on our way to go and film Street, a uh, portrait of an artist. And, and You'll see the link and stuff for it down below. And now, if anyone wants to point uh, to pop in the questions, um, there's a little subliminal message in this. 
for where I live. And if someone puts that in the message, I'll be absolutely very, very pleased if you can work out what it is. But if you look here, I've dragged the shutter. He's got a nice big step on. I was, I could see him walking through the carriage. There's a little bit of luck because he's got that step on and his friend's directly behind him. But there's sort of a few elements in that that make it. But there's that simplicity that makes the image as well. So just sort of look at how I'm going to treat it. And this has had the same treatment and the same sort of preset that I had um, with the guy who was outside Harrods. This was shot on the way, on the same day and on the way to Camden. So this you'll see in the film, uh, which I'm not going to show on here, you'll be able to watch it after the, the webinar. Um, this was actually shot on one of the canals and it was a really, really gloomy day. And this is how you can make a gloomy day become your friend because the light bounces off the water, hits the roof of the, um, the bridge on the canal and it just creates this backlight in everyone. So you get this really, really beautiful silhouette and you're just using the elements around you as your studio tool. So you, I'm just walking around with one camera and one lens and getting these results. And it's just looking and observing, looking at those leading lines, trying to get lines coming from the corners. There's lots of lines, but it makes your eye run across the whole whole image. And no one is really identifiable in that either, so it's fine. If you're wondering what if people are identifiable, they can be used for editorial, um, but they can't be used for commercial use without a model release. This is William. I met him um, on my travels in Camden and I just went up to him and said, look, mate, can I take your phone? He said, yeah, sure. And I said, I'll oh, just stand by that van. That'll be really, really cool. And this is what you'll call a street portrait. Um, and you, this is what it's called a street portrait. And so I just stood there and stand there for me. And then he just whipped out this gesture and went, boom, took the photo, one shot, that's all I needed. I said, thanks, mate, showed his hand and uh, on the way. And he's from Italy. He's over here having a great time. Um, this was back in November. So he hasn't come over in the last week in case you're thinking that. Um, but he's, he's just out there and a really, really nice guy. And this is the classic, don't judge a book by its cover. Um, uh, there's so many wonderful characters in London um, that you can meet and, and you can meet shooting street photography. It's absolutely wonderful. But again, if you don't want to approach people or you just want to go around and maybe enjoy the street art, this is ideal for you. This is just off Brick Lane. And I believe this painting may not be there anymore. There's some amazing wall art around uh, Camden. If you can sort of go out there um, and give there's a really really good question just come up from drew um he's asking did i ask the homeless man's permission and did it did i give him a few quid um i wanted to approach a homeless man and i had a mind with me um at the time and i wanted to sort of find out his issues or you know what was going on um and i was advised not to now because it's editorial um, that could be used but i cannot sell that image for commercial gain or commercial usage. They can only be used for editorial use. Um, but yes, I would have loved to put a few quid or yen in his bag that I was advised not to. So sort of going back and getting amongst people, um, this again is in Camden. If anyone loves Monty Python, you'll know this, these guys are dressed up as the Gumbies. And if I'd stood back and taken this photo, it wouldn't have worked. But because I sort of went up to and spoke to them and got entrenched in them and they all crowded around me, I've got this amazing image and my angle is really low, so it makes it interesting as well. So they love this. They were there for a big gathering of the Gumbies at the Roundhouse, got that image and they loved it. And on most of the people I photograph, I will ask for their details so I can send them a copy. And I think that's really, really important. Um, because that's if I don't uh, send it, then that, that's not fair on them. Um, Thomas, uh, street photography. Do I prefer a fixed focal length lens or a zoom? I prefer a prime or fixed focal length lens and I just use a 15 mil so my legs become my zoom. I find a zoom will be too big and uh, too intrusive um, whereas I can get all these images just using uh, one fixed lens. It's a 30 mil equivalent full frame. On micro four thirds it's a 15 mil Leica uh, on a GX9 camera. And then I'll sort of go in close or get wide. So I've got that nice wide look, 
but I can also get that nice up, up and personal look, up close and personal. Um, so, and someone else has just asked a question, which I've just answered, which is what camera do I use for street photography to be discreet, which is a Lumix GX9. It's a nice, I won't go out with a big camera. I've gone out with a big camera before and I actually felt a little bit intimidated. I also, um, you'll see the camera I use when you, if you watch the street uh, portrait of an artist film. And I've actually got a black rapid strap. It's a wrist strap which goes around my uh, wrist as well. Um, and that gives me a bit of security as well. No one's going to be able to steal it, but no one is interested because it's a small camera. Uh, even though it's got a 20 megapixel sensor, no one's uh, interested in that as well. Um, so that, that sort of helps. So these people I spoke to before I took their photo. Now the battery light was just flashing and flashing and flashing. And um, I knew it was going to die. And I sort of went up to them and Matt, and this is when we were filming and we spoke to them and sort of found out their situation. Um, and I said, can I take this one photo? And they said, yes, absolutely. It's not a problem. Yes, we did give them some money as well. Just as I got down to take the photo, the couple behind walked through and you can see it's a slow shutter and the couple have got their arm around them who are homeless and then the couple who are heading home um, have got their arm around each other as well. I, the, the heartbreaking thing about this image, I couldn't show them the image because as soon as I took this, the battery ran out. So I couldn't show it to them. The only way I could look at the photo, and the ironic thing was I couldn't look at the photo until I got home, which is really heartbreaking. And because I don't live in London, I wasn't there the next day. Um, but Matt, who filmed the a film, he's going to try and um, see if they're there still and 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 show them. So the um, the film I'm talking about, if you want to get into your street photography, and it'll give you sort of a few guidelines as well. Um, it's called Street Portrait of an Artist. If you look at that on uh, my YouTube channel, or you can search it on um, Vimeo as well. It's in 4K, and you you'll sort of get a good sort of um, look at what it's like there. Um, I'm just sort of scanning, th I'm finish up quickly and then uh, I'll be able to go through all the questions for you as well. If you want to also have a look at the podcast which I'm involved in, which is called Talking Shot. Um, Talking Shot podcast is, uh, is a team of us who sort of do it and we, we've done two with Color Confidence as well. So if you want to look at your ICC profiling and your color management, there's some good episodes on there. And then we've had uh, Viviana Galletta just talking about natural light or flat, which is really interesting as well. And the current one, which is George Fairburn about business survival, reinventing yourself and stop motion. And that's a great thing for kids to do, stop motion. Um, in fact, George did a thing for kids on his YouTube channel the other day, so you can sort of check that out. And you guys who are watching this, you'll get a sneak peek of what's coming up next in the next episode which is um, James Musselwhite and Scott Johnson, Half Naked Men and Lost in Venice. So I won't tell you any more about that. You'll have to subscribe. So just go to uh, any good uh, podcast app uh, or to the website talkingshot.co.uk and you'll check out our podcast library there. Um, before I answer any questions, um, I'm going to pop up a little deal for you as well because you would have seen on Wix They've, had, they've been uh, very kindly promoting uh, the webinar and they've also got some great deals on there at the moment, which if you go in and use the code from BenQ products, which is at the monitors, you'll get 5% off at the checkout. So use BenQ-5 um, and if you want 10% off X-Rite products, which is your calibration equipment, like the color checker, which you saw, um, the i1 studio, the um, i1 display and you get kits as well. Use XWrite hyphen 10 for 10% 10 off the checkouts. And that ends on April the 2nd. So you can go and have a look, look at that. So Q and A's. I'm going to jump into the into the questions and have a, a look now. Um, so if I can just bring them all down. There's lots of questions here, which is fantastic, guys. Um, uh, right, Thomas, we've answered those. Okay. The market photo, people's guesses about the plant. It's not a carrot. And Alex, it's not corn. But Alan, Ian, Tim, Colin, uh, you've all guessed right. It is a banana plant. So um, the one just 
uh, earlier, not many people have gotten that and four of you have gotten that and I'm quite impressed. And where do I live? I live very near Tembe, so, uh, which is in Pembrokeshire and I have a studio down here as well. Uh, which I run my commercial business and my uh, portrait business from, but I also travel with my commercial business. Um, and also shooting on this monitor for the last month is absolutely amazing. And I'm not saying that I don't get paid to say that I love a monitor at all, but I've just had my experiences and actually shooting on a monitor that has no, uh, editing on a monitor that has no reflection or anything on it. Is, like I said at the start, has really improved my editing. And I, like I said, I'm not a great fan of editing, but I'm starting, I'm enjoying my editing now because of this. And I also, I don't just edit stills on it. I also edit um, film because I do some little uh, films for uh, corporate clients in that as well. So if that needs done as well, that's really, really good. Um, also for the X-Rite charts, um, you'll get 50% off Adobe Creative Cloud. So if you want to go in there, um, and you want to get your creative crowd, that's a good time to save as well. So you can save some pennies as well. Um, I do, from Tim, I do my uh, calibrating about once a week. It, it's probably a little bit over, overkill, um, but I just tend to find that's the habit I've got into, and it works for me. You may want to do every two weeks. It depends on, on what works for you. Uh, from, from Christian, when did I get into... Uh, high speed sync or HSS, gosh, probably only about a year or so ago. Um, and I haven't been using it a lot. Um, but when you want to go out and you want to do a sunset and you want to shoot it, high speed sync means you're shooting above the normal sync uh, of the camera. So the lights allow you to do that. So normally on a camera, the sync will be maybe 250th, 200, or maybe 320. So the one I think with Esther was about uh, one eight thousandth of a second or something like that. And that allows you to get, um, can, to control the ambience behind and also pop in um, some flash as well. So I, the ambience is controlled by a shutter speed and that's the, how I tend to work with um, high speed sync. Um, for Barry, I use um, both auto and manual focus. Um, it depends what I'm shooting because sometimes I want to actually get a fix a uh, fixed focal point and I'll wait for people to walk in. So then I will manually focus for that. Um, other times, say if there's a crowd of people around, I will use autofocus. So it just depends what I'm um, photographing as well. So while I'm, while I'm at home, I am photographing all sorts of things I can find around the house at the moment. Um, from, I'm also having to go at stop motion. I'm also, uh, polishing up on my time-lapse skills. I'm doing little bits in the studio that I, and tidying up that that I wouldn't normally do. I'm shooting more outside. Um, so it's given me sort of this this time off is, is the best way to put it, um, sort of refocus on how I sort of work and what I want to shoot. And it's allowed me to sort of hone up on my skills because the thing is with a photography, we never stop learning. And that's the beauty of it as well. Um, there's lots of information, um, Robert, about the laws um, on photographing street photography. There is a government uh, website, but as rule of thumb, um, act with respect um, and act. Uh, the, the way I tend to act is if you didn't want to be photographed in that situation, um, don't. Obviously, if you're on private property, you have to get permission. Um, if you can't sort of go zooming into people's houses and things like that, you know, a bit of common sense comes into place there as well. Um, so, and the interaction with people. Um, the camera bag that was shown is a, a think tank retrospective 30. Um, I've actually put that through a wash because I did a shoot with it and it ended up with a load of cow poo on it. So I took all the padding out and put it through the wash and, it, and it's come through pretty well. Um, my process for printing, I've got, I do in-house uh, prints uh, on an Epson printer for my printing. My canvases, I outsource because the guy who does it, um, he absolutely nails it every time. And that's due to, he calibrates as well. Um, 
all the screens calibrated. I sent in my work, which is calibrated. So what appears on my screen is what he delivers back to me. And that's that's very, very important. Um, if there's any other questions, guys, um, I'm sure we'll be able to answer them later. But thank you so much for um, getting in touch. If you want to get in touch with me, please drop me a line. There's all my details. This is my Instagram. Give me a follow. If you want to, if you're on Twitter, feel free to follow me there. Facebook, Ross Green Photography, the website, which needs a big overhaul, which is one of my jobs during this time as well. Um, and of course, if you want to follow the podcast, that would be amazing. It's been great, guys. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope to see you again soon. Cheers, guys.